Good to see each of you here this morning. It's so good to be in the house of the Lord, and we're finally back together again. Uh, I have some announcements that I'll go over what's in the bulletin about everything's in here that you need to know. Picking and grinning update, the last picking and grinning. Uh, we had 150 people in attendance. $501 was raised for the Welcome uh, School Backpack Program and $379 for the meal, uh, which went toward the Picking and Grinning Fund. Reminder that this Tuesday night, the Women's Ministry will meet at 7 o'clock. Uh, Vacation Bible School will begin on June the 13th. Uh, Tina said you still need some volunteers that would help with that. There's a new Sunday school class that started this morning in Warren Martin, Warren Martin, <laughs> Warren Miller is teaching that class and we hope that he will have some good attendance for that. So if you don't belong to a Sunday school class now and you're looking for one, give Warren's class a try. Uh, safe sanctuary training, will, another class will be June the 9th and one again on June the 10th. It is necessary that you go through that if you wanna be working with the youth in uh, capacity here in this church. Sheila McKinney is going to be having another painting class on Saturday, June the 19th in the fellowship hall and you can sign up uh, on the sign up sheet which is located in the narthex of the Christian Fellowship Center. Uh, also, uh, it's not in the bulletin, but the graduation uh, bulletins have been reprinted. Uh, they were some names that were cut short in the original bulletin and some pictures in there kind of off skewed, but it's been reprinted. If you'd like a copy, you can pick those up on either side of the church. Any other que uh, comments, questions, announcements this morning? Y'all really quiet. Well, let's pray to God. Dear God, our Father in heaven, we give thanks this morning for your many blessings given to each of us. All that we have is a gift from you, and you are our hope and our future in this world of chaos. It is so easy to get caught up in the ridiculous things that people say and do because the media likes crazy. Our leaders in government like power and will say and do anything to get a vote. They ignore the teachings in our Bible as the only truth, and they form their own Jesus by picking the parts they like while ignoring the parts of the Bible that they don't like. And I pray that we as Christians recognize the straight and the narrow truth to follow your will for us. The scriptures state that only a few will see the kingdom of heaven. And I pray that we all can get there together. We love and worship you this morning. Amen. And welcome to center. To skip the call to worship and go right to our first hymn, Blessed Assurance. But before we do that, I want to tell you that my little three-year-old grandson just come up here to the to the chancel area just a few minutes ago and said, Mimo, I've not been in this church in a long time. <laughs> and I thought, well, I haven't either. And isn't it wonderful? Isn't it wonderful to be back? So leave it to Leave it to a child to bring it all back together. Let us stand and sing Blessed Assurance.
that was just wonderful. That, that the sound in here is just, I could hear you. I could hear you singing back, and it was wonderful. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. I would like to take this opportunity to recognize our rising third graders. Rising third graders, it's hard to say that and see that here. Um, with the presentation of a Bible from our women's ministry, uh, we would like to ask right now at this time if Micah Hollingsworth would come forward. And now we'd like to ask Caitlin Leonard to come forward. We'd just like to wish them the best in the future and may God be with them. We'd like to take this opportunity to invite all of the children to our Sunday school. Right now we are learning of wonder women of the Bible. We always hear about the men in the Bible but we are studying those for the next few weeks, and we'd like to invite everyone downstairs at 10 o'clock every Sunday morning. And if all the kids would come on up for children's time. Hello. All right. All right. I have to do me a favor, though. You've got to back up just a little bit because Miss Angie has a Pepsi up here, and I don't want to get it on you. All right. It's part of my lesson, just to let you guys know. No, you cannot drink it. All right. So before we get started, I want to say, guess what time it is? Summer. It's summertime. Yeah. Whoop, whoop. Well, it's no school. How about this? Okay, my child is giving me a lesson. All right, so no school. Yay! Super stoked. I'm super stoked. I got one more day left. Yay! Okay, anyway. Guess what's coming up next week after next? Not Father's Day. Well, that is coming up. Bible school. Who is stoked about Bible school? Who wants to come? You are. I am. I'm super stoked. It's going to begin on June the 13th, and Miss Angie is so excited. We're going to start decorating this week, and we're going to start painting, and I'm so excited. Yeah? Okay. So I had to get that out there. All right. So today, we are going to do a lesson about sin. Who knows what sin is? Yeah. Everybody knows what sin is, and we all sin. Have you ever felt that doing something wrong, you just felt like, mm, I'm going to keep it a secret? So I did something bad, but I don't want to tell anybody I did something bad. So I don't think anybody's ever going to find out that I did that bad thing. But do you want to know what? Did you know that no matter how hard we keep hiding our sins or our secrets, they have a way of becoming known? So let me show you what I'm talking about. All right, so Miss Angie likes object lessons. So I have a cup. See the cup? The cup is you. The cup represents you guys. I have a Pepsi. The Pepsi represents that secret place in our body that we hide our secrets and we hide our sins. So Miss Angie, if I don't make a mess, is going to pour the Pepsi in the cup. All right. So now I have some buttons. Miss Angie has three buttons. The buttons represent sin. Like this button could represent, I don't know, maybe there was a TV show that you asked mommy and daddy to watch and they said no. And what did you do? You watched it anyway. Then this button could be, I don't know, you hit your brother or sister and nobody ever found out about it. You didn't tell. They didn't tell. We kept that a secret. Or there was a cookie. Hmm. There was that wonderful chocolate chip cookie on the table. And Mama said, you cannot have it until after supper. But <clears throat> you ate it anyway. But didn't ever tell Mama about it. So here's our little sins. We're going to put them in that secret hiding place. Watch. 
Oh, look, they're gone. They're hidden. Uh-oh, what happened? It came up. So we can put our secrets and our sins in our hiding places. Every time I push them back down, they get hidden, but they always reappear, don't they? So what is it best to do? To tell. That's right. If you do eat that cookie, I bet you your mommy won't be mad if you tell her the truth. Or if you do accidentally hit your sister or brother, I bet if you tell the truth, you won't get in so much big of a trouble, even though you really probably shouldn't hit your brother or sister. But if we tell the truth or, you know, or if we try our best not to sin, that makes things a whole lot better, right? Right. Our Bible verse today says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us for our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. That comes from 1 John 1 through 9. And he can clean us from our sins, right? All right, so let's bow our heads and close our eyes and we'll say our morning prayer. Dear God, thank you for forgiving us from our sins. Thank you for loving us no matter what. And please help us have a safe and fun summer. And all the kiddos say, Amen. All right, so Miss Angie's going to go downstairs for Children's Church. And any kids that want to join me, I would love to have you. And lift up uh, needs you might have. I want to remember, remind you of a couple needs. We're glad to have Renee Bailey back. Renee, somewhere right there is Renee. We're glad to have her with us today. She's doing some treatments. So we're thankful for her and Larry. And uh, we want to continue to remember Gavin and Mom and Dad and Gracie in your prayers. We want to remember uh, Jacobs. Oh, my goodness. Ed. Let's remember Ed and Shirley. Ed was diagnosed with some melanoma cancer, and he thanked the Lord. He went and had some scan work done this week, found out it's not spread anywhere, but he is going to have to have some surgery, and there's some other things going on in Ed's life with his health. So let's remember Ed in your prayers. They ask us to remember him, so let's do that. All right. Any other needs you have, you have to speak up because I cannot hear you, okay? I really can't. I'd like for you to remember Naomi all good. Your aunt. Naomi all good. Just remember Naomi. Any others? Janice Guffey, best aunt with cancer treatments. We need to remember her. Any others? Also, we want to remember Hollis. Uh, that's Jamie Duncan's sister. She has cancer as well, and she's going to have surgery this week, I think, Friday. So let's remember Hollis in your prayers. She requests your prayers as well. So uh, any others? Okay, then let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father, we just stop to thank you and praise you. God, our life is, is uh, we're not in control of nothing. We, we own absolutely nothing in our life. You own everything. You own our past. You own our future. And precious Lord, you've heard these needs that have been lifted up in this place. We pray for Naomi. Whatever those needs are in her life, we ask your touch upon her. We lift up, this, we lift up the many people that we've heard already today with cancer. From uh, Bess Aunt to... Uh, Hollis, to Ed, uh, and these others, Lord, we lift them to you. You know their battles. You know the young and old and what they're having to deal with. God, you know the financial difficulties some of our people have in this place. You know some other health issues that they're wrestling with. There's some, some issues in their future that they're struggling with there's there's a pressures of raising family and children god that you, they're, they're feeling that and the god there's others that are trying to run businesses in this difficult climate and so you feel those pressures lord remind us all that again you own it all you own it all 
and we have to trust you. God, we give all these circumstances into your hands, thanking you that you've called us in such a time as this, that you'll be exalted in our life, and you'll be lifted up if we'll allow you to be so. God, Vacation Bible School's coming up, and there's going to be a lot of kids gather on these grounds. We're praying, Father, for the boldness of our teachers to ask them about their souls and to lead these children to Jesus this week. God, you've given them to us, and we're expecting to see great and mighty things happen. We're going to thank you. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. At this time, we'll continue our giving of God's tithe and offerings as our ushers come forward. holy word 
Thank you, Molly. If you'll stand for the reading of 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verses 10 through 13. 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verses 10 through 13. When this was written, David uh, is the king of Israel, and uh, he has asked the people to bring forth their gifts to build the temple, and this is his response to their generous heart. And it's just awesome. I want you to hear these words. hope you'll memorize them uh, as well and uh, put this to your heart. First Chronicles chapter 29, verses 10 and following. David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly, saying, Praise be to you, Lord, the God of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power, and the glory, and the majesty, and the splendor. For everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and to give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. This is the word of God for you, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that we've heard your word this morning. And now we pray that you'd help us to be doers of your word. Transform our hearts, Lord, those places that need your recreation. God, you know our needs, and we give them to you. Guide us and open our mind to be your disciples. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And you can be seated. Heard a story one time about this old farmer that came to the preacher and said that his farm wasn't doing so good and asked him if he would pray for him about that and he said his cows wasn't even calfing good. He wasn't, wasn't even getting any new cows. So the preacher said, yeah, we'll pray about that. So they prayed about it and prayed about it. And so finally he said, okay. He said, uh, uh, preacher said, if I have a calf, I'm going to give that first calf to the Lord. He said, wow, that'd be great. I said, okay. So time passed on, and sure enough, uh, the old fella, come, the old farmer comes to the preacher and says, hey, I got good news. The preacher said, I had two calves, had twins from the same cow. Wow, that's wonderful. That's good. He said, yeah. He said, I, you know why I told you? Giving one of them to the Lord. He said, all right. He said, but now what I'm going to do is keep it until I get it. I'm going to grow it up. It'd be a great, uh, we'll sell that thing at the market. We'll, we'll make good money on it. I said, okay. So time passed, you know, and finally one day the preacher went to check on the investment. And the old farmer was long-faced and said, yeah, we had some problems, preacher. He said, really? He said, yeah. He said, you know, cows was doing good. They, they, they were doing great. And he said, uh, I was about to take one to the market, to take them both to the market, and uh, they died. One of them died. The preacher said, they died? One died? Yeah, yeah, one of them died. He said, I hate that preacher. He said, you know, that was the Lord's cow that died. <laughs> hey, it's always the Lord's cow. You know, Lord, if I, if I wasn't so old, I could do this. Lord, if, it was, if I had a little bit more money, I could do this. Lord, if I was younger, I could do this. Lord, if I'd had more of an education, it's always the Lord's cow that'll die. David is an amazing creature. This, this passage is chock full of stuff. God has told David that he is not going to build a temple. Now, that was his heart's desire. He wanted to do it. Told him that his son Solomon would build the temple. David, though, was all behind building that. Now, wouldn't that have been easy for David to have pulled back and resented that a little bit? You know? Maybe even resented God, resented his child. Because he says earlier in the chapter before that he lacks experience, his son does. So David knows what Solomon's up against. But what does David do? David gives immensely from his wealth to God's work. 
I want you to look with me at all the stuff that he gives. He gives gifts of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, precious stones, all kind of other material, 28.2 tells us, to the Lord's work. He gives 3,000 talents of gold from a place called Ophir and also Arabia and the African coast. So that's the influence we know that, that David had. That he brings all these precious, this precious gold. 3,000 talents. Gives 7,000 talents of silver. Well, Mitch, what is all that? Well, all I can tell you is that's equivalent of 260 tons of silver. I cannot grasp that. I can see a ton truck in my head. I can get a hold of that, okay? And we're going to fill 260 ton trucks with silver. Somebody that's got the idiot phone, do the figures, and you can shout out the figure and tell me how much that was. Uh, 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 Hunter's daughter shouted that out to me today, and I've already forgotten what she said that was. $143 million. That's amazing, isn't it? That's what David, that's what David gives. Now, there's more brought in beyond that. Now, that's what David does. He brings the leaders in and says, hey, this is the need we have. And it says that when he made this appeal to the people, they brought forth their gifts. First Chronicles 29, 6, it says they willingly gave their gifts. Think about that. They willingly brought their gifts to God's work. Do we willingly bring our gifts to God's work? Or do we reluctantly give them? Are we worried about what somebody else thinks? Or do we give out a compulsion? Now, this week, you've probably been bombarded by all kind of people wanting money from you in the mailbox or this month. If you haven't, when you sit down at the house and you're finally sitting down with your TV dinner and everything's doing good and, and you're sitting to watch TV, what happens on TV? You get bombarded with all kind of images from dogs needing your money and pets, right? to veterans needing your help, to fallen police officers needing your help or firemen, uh, to sick kids in hospitals needing your help. You name it, you get, and, the, and the truth is, they're probably pretty, all, pretty much legitimate what we're sitting and watching, aren't they? But if you're not careful, though, what you'll do, you'll give out of compulsion. You know, you see the guy on the side of the road, you give out of compulsion, not from your heart, Paul wrote to the, to the Corinthians, and this is what he said about how our giving ought to be. 2 Corinthians 9, 7. You must each decide in your heart how much to give, and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. Wow. That changes the whole attitude of giving. And yet that's exactly the attitude all these leaders had as they come together, they give willingly. They bring all this stuff in. So how much do they give willingly to? How much do they bring in? It is a phenomenal amount of stuff. Hear what the passages before I read to you says. They brought in 190 tons of gold. They brought in 1,000 derricks of gold. I don't know what that is, but it's equivalent of 185 pounds, whatever that is. That is a lot of gold. They brought in... Uh, 375, this is what the leaders brought in. Now, this is beyond what, what uh, David gave. And by the way, David had already given more money before this. 375 tons of silver. Of bronze, 675 tons. They brought in 30,750 tons of iron. Wow. And that doesn't count the precious gems. They take the... They take, literally, they take their jewelry from their noses and their ears and they bring it and they give it to God's work. And they all gave it willingly. So much so that David rejoices about that. Not only does David rejoice, the people are rejoicing over what they see their leaders bring in. And they're all celebrating and it's an attitude of praise and that's what the passage lights in on, that God, you're the one who owns everything. What a principle that is. These folks realize it's God's and they're simply bringing it back to the storehouse. Wow, that is so radical. 
What would happen in your life, in my life, if we come to the point with everything in our life right now that's bugging us, whatever it is, you name it, and we just said, hey, God, it's yours. It's yours. What if we said today, June the 6th, 2021, God, this is yours. This is yours on this holy place. I'm going to remember a, a cool sanctuary on a hot May, a June day, and God, I gave this to you, and I said, Lord, this is yours because you own it anyway. You know, the Bible says he does own everything. He says, he's specific in that passage, David reflects back, that God owns everything under the heavens. God even owns you. God owns you. God owns, you, you, you're nothing. You're not a self-made person. We love to use that phrase in America. They're a self-made man. We don't say that much about the women because we know the women are all self-made. They ain't nobody self-made. They're nobody self-made. You, every one of us, stand on the shoulders of somebody else. You stand on the shoulders of somebody else. Somebody else blessed you. Somebody else blessed you. Contrary to what you see on television and how they're going to start teaching your kids in, in high school and in elementary school, this country was birthed by a group of people who came here for freedom. They came here for freedom, folks. Did they get it all right along the way? No, they mess up along the way. They sure do. Just like you mess up along the way. Just like every person, every nation has messed up along the way. But the only thing that's been different about a place called America, there is such a thing as, I heard a preacher tell me the other day he didn't believe in American exceptionalism. I said, oh, no. Yeah, there is American exceptionalism because it was built on a Judeo-Christian heritage. Again, were they perfect? No. Far from it. Far from it. They were built in a more perfect union. And as you work, that, that's a work in progress. But as these dear people poured out everything they had, and interesting enough, as we come up on the 4th of July, it's easy to think that the, the folks that signed for the Declaration of Independence, it's easy to think these are just run-of-the-mill people. No, my friends, they are not. They are the cream of the crop of society. They had absolutely everything to lose. They were the wealthy. And they stepped up to the plate and signed their name on a piece of paper. Because they believed in something. They believed in some principles. And so this country was birthed. But what makes her so exceptional is not that, but that this has been a mission-sending agency to the world to share Jesus Christ. God used her. God still use, and God's still using her. And that's what's so amazing. Now, yeah, God's blessed us. And God, we, we step on the, the, the shoulders, the footprints of other people who've made the difference for us in our life, and we, we step forward to be who we are as a people and try to find our way as a people. And all our, all our warts and all everything. But we're a blessed people. We have been a blessed people. And to say otherwise is, is blasphemous to Almighty God. It's blasphemous. God has done so much for us. And for you to think that what you have is yours, you're so foolish. Let me tell you how I know you're foolish. How many of you have an automobile? Raise your hand. Well, this will be interesting. Put your hands down. How many of you rode a moped here today? You still got to have a tag for that now, don't you? They always looking for money. Well, guess what? That car, you work hard to pay for it, don't you? Pay work hard. You work hard to pay for that thing. Finally, you get it paid for. Boy, that's a good feeling, isn't it? Not to get that little, little receipt book out and write on something or get something in the mail. Isn't that a great feeling? Because it's yours. No, it ain't. you got to go get a tag for that thing. And then suddenly you realize they have put some taxes on for that car that you bought for $18,000. And you're still paying for it. Wow, you know that house you love, you and your wife, you suffered, you struggled, you prayed, you've done everything, you got it paid for. No, no, no. Every year Davidson County sends you a little letter, don't they? reminding you what that property's worth to the county. 
To keep your house, you get to pay some rent every year. No, you don't own anything. The only thing you own is the casket they're going to put you in. Think about that. I said that at the other church this morning. Somebody said, no, no, no. Somebody had to pay for that. No, you don't care. <laughs> Listen, folks. <laughs> Colonial Pen can say I need my burial insurance. No, I don't. No, I don't. I don't need burial insurance. Josh, Wesley, Chris, and Annie <laughs> needs burial insurance. Because Beth don't care if I'm dead in this corner sitting there or not. <laughs> her and her boyfriend's going to be gone off spending my pension money. <laughs> no, she don't care. Yeah, the casket really is all that's ours. And we don't get to enjoy it. <laughs> Fine. You go down to Davidson Funeral Home, oh, guess what they'll start telling you about? This is what they'll start telling you about. The couch. I'm serious. They talk about the couch inside the casket. That's the springs and stuff. <laughs> uh, who cares? <laughs> I, I mean, it, that, the plyboard will be fine for me because remember, you're a Christian, you're not here. See, God's given us, God, we laugh and all that stuff, but listen, folks. What principle, those four words would change your life today? God owns it all. If you realize God owns it all, it takes the stress level off, worrying about your kids, worrying about the health issues that you have, worrying about your loneliness, about your future. God owns it all, child. God owns it all. You have been bought with a price God owns it all. Your life is not your own, the Apostle Paul wrote. God owns it all. Everything under the heavens, God owns. Regardless of how hard and how tough your health gets, God still owns it. And God still owns you. And God's going to see you through. God owns it all. You don't own anything. You, you're so, we're so tied up with money. We're so... We, we, just, we just love money and we think money's everything in the world. Money ain't nothing. Money's nothing. Think about what Chuck Swindoll says in, in an old book he wrote, Strengthening Your Grip. He said this, there's some things that money can't buy. He says, money can buy medicine but not health. Money can buy a house but not a home. Money can buy companionship but not friends. Money can buy entertainment but not happiness. Money can buy food, but not an appetite. Money can buy a bed, but not sleep. Money can buy a crucifix, but not a Savior. Money can buy the good life, but not eternal life. No, money is not where we find our meaning. God owns everything including what we count as our money. The most liberating thought in the world is the fact that God owns our bank account, owns our family, owns our future. He owned our past. He owned it all. So what are we doing with it? Matthew 25, 14 and 13, he tells a story about, about some servants. A, a wise man, a, a man of great wealth, was going off on a trip. And, and to one of them, he gives him five bags of gold, and to another, he gives two bags of gold, and to another, one bag of gold. And he says, you, you go, you invest this, take care of it until I come back. The one who had the five bags of gold, what does he do? When the master comes back, he comes walking in when he says, hey, I want to show you what I'll have done with your money. He brings him in double the amount. Man, he had really worked and made that investment. And the other one comes in, he had two bags, but he brings in four bags. He says, Lord, this is what I have. And both times the Lord said to both of them, Wow, you've been good, faithful servants. You've been faithful over a little. You're going to be faithful over much. What a great stewardship principle. Then the other one comes in, and it looks like he's a good guy, doesn't it? He, he, he comes in with his one bag, and the master's looking, and he says, well, I took care of it. I went and buried it. So nobody could take, get it, and nobody would steal from you. And what does the Lord say to him? He said, you wicked servant. He was 
hoarding it back. My friends, are, are we hoarding back? Or are we building the kingdom of God? I heard a great story by a man. Look him up. He's a great video. Stanley Tim is who he is. He, he started a company called United States Plastics many years ago. Started out in the uh, working in silver, I think, silver plating and things. And, and the business wasn't going well for Stanley, and he was, he was just really struggling with it. And he was a Christian man, and one day he was talking to God about it. And God said, he told God about what a burden it was. And, and the Lord said to him, Stanley, it ought not be a burden to you. You need to give it to me. Let me take care of your business. And he did. He went and he hunted him a lawyer. And the first, the first lawyer he went into, he said, I want to give the Lord controlling interest in my business. And the lawyer looked at him and said, well, I'll tell you what you do. You pray about that for a couple of months and you come back and talk to me and let's see what we can do. So you know what Stanley did? He immediately went to another lawyer and told the lawyer what he wanted to do. And the lawyer, he was reluctant to him. Stanley told him, he said, look, I'm going to do this today. I'm not leaving till you do it. You're going to work this paperwork up. God's going to be the controlling interest in my company. And indeed, God, that's the way they worked it up. He, he had the, God had controlling interest in a trust Stanley had a heart for evangelism. It's interesting enough that he, he loved seeing souls won. He worked with his employees. He shared his faith with his employees. He shared with other people. He heard about organizations that were training people to go out in the neighborhoods and share their faith around the world. So Stanley invested in them, and that's where that 51% of the profits went to, to those organizations. Stanley was doing that for years. Company was doing good. And then, tape, again, Stanley, you need to look up Stanley Tim. It's powerful. I heard about him many years ago, and last night about 12.15, got on my mind again. I had to hunt that video up, and I found the old Stanley Tim. So Stanley was preaching somewhere, teaching, at some big conference, and he said God was moving in a mighty way. And he was so touched, and then he, God was on his case and said, Stanley, give me all your business. I mean, that, now think about that a minute. He said, give me all your business. And Stanley was immediately convicted. How in the world am I going to give God all my, all my bits? How am I going to do all this? And he, he was really struggling with all that. And so finally, he surrendered his whole business to God. And now he's retired. And, uh, but Stanley's business now, 100% of the profits go to reaching people for Jesus. Uh, what was his name? Laterno, of the earth moving equipment. Same kind of story about how God spoke to him. His business was struggling. That's another great story of faith. Great, great businessman. Realizing we don't own nothing. We don't own nothing. What would happen in this country if, if the President of the United States, well, first off, the news wouldn't show it. You'd have to catch that in somewhere else. But if the President said, you know, we're messing up in this country. God owns it all. And I'm going to ask you to call on God to help our country. What would happen? You see, the Republicans and Democrats have led us off the cliff, folks. They have. You can sit and say what you want to. Keep voting for that same crazy crowd. They keep on taking you off because they're wanting to visualize something else for your nation. But what would happen? What would happen if the leaders of this church said, God, we're going to give you this church. We're going to recognize you as God. And we're going to give you this church. And we relook at the whole way we do missions and we, we serve this community. What would happen today to the people around you if you, you took them to God in a few minutes? And you said, I'm going to reach my family with God's help for Jesus Christ because God owns it. What would happen? What would happen if we really got serious as a church that we really wanted to reach people for Jesus instead of reaching ourselves? Because that's what we're hung up on is ourselves. What would happen if we got serious with God and said, hey, God, you own it all. I'm nothing, Lord. 
your everything. What would happen to you? That struggle with your, your, your finances, what would happen with it? What would happen? What would happen with your health issues? What would happen to it? God will see you through it. God will see you through it. That's what happened to you. What about you? Is it all working out pretty good for you, what you're doing? I mean, is it really working out good for you, what you're doing? Does God own it all? Are you taking back what you think and just hoarding it back? How much is enough? How much is enough? How much is enough in your family? For your family? How much is enough? How much is enough for a church? How much is enough? Do we finally say, God, I've had enough? And it's up to you. What kind of teacher would you be? What kind of difference would you make for Jesus Christ? I asked that at three services today, and I've absolutely been amazed at how God's worked and touched people's hearts. I'm going to ask you in just a moment to stand right where you are. I want you to think about what I've said this morning. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not manipulating you. I haven't raised my voice at you. I'm not scaring you. What would happen if you simply said, God, I'm making a deal with you? You like that show, Deal or No Deal? You ever watch that on TV? How many of you ever watch that on TV? I absolutely am addicted to that show. I am so addicted to that show, I watch the reruns and, st and still can't figure out what they're going to do. It is a phenomenal show. And the deal is, are you going to keep on going to try to get that million dollars? Hey, what's the deal? The deal with you is, are you going to deal with God today? And say, Lord, hey, it all belongs to you. And God, I've come to this place in my life, I'm tired of dealing. It's time I settle it. What would that look like for you? This is your moment to make that decision for Jesus Christ. Every disciple Jesus called, he called them publicly. Every single one of them. There's nobody hid that I know of that he calls. And he calls us to walk publicly in the public square. I want to ask you this morning, would you be willing to say, hey, this morning, June the 6th, 1980, uh, by the way, June the 6th, 1984 is my wife's birthday. 66. Well, yeah, she has six. I, I don't know nothing. June the 6th, 66. Yeah, her, her birthday, 6666. Six, six. So that's easy for me to remember. It, when I, sometimes it is. Sometimes when you're not dumb. I'm just challenged. Just overlook me. Lord, I, I realize you own it all. June 6, 2021, I stood up for you and I said, Lord, here it is. What about you? We're fixing to sing a hymn. Would you stand with your eyes closed if God spoke to you today? You've handled it enough. It's time today in a good, cool sanctuary to make some decisions for him to move forward. Would you do that? Would you stand where you're at? Would you stand if God spoke to your heart today? If he spoke to your heart, if he hadn't spoke, it's fine. Let's bow our heads. Oh, gracious Father, the needs are great in this place. The needs was great when you, out of nothing, you spoke to King David to build your, your house. 
the need is great as you're wanting to build a house and every life that's in this place. God, speak to us. Give us courage to surrender to you because you own it all. Everything under the heavens is yours. So God, we're going to have to trust you with it. We're coming clean. Admitting we really can't do anything. God, we're giving it to you. And we're going to thank you and praise you for what you do. Bless every home. Bless every life today. Pour out your Holy Spirit. We claim them by the blood of Jesus. Cleansing where that needs to happen. We pray for the work and the anointing of your Spirit. God, whatever that is, whatever that needs to be, we're praying for that for every life because every person in this place is significant to you and we're claiming them for you in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. And we receive that in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn is Be Thou My Vision. May, that, may, may He be your vision leading you on into the future. Sing the third verse, please. Great God of heaven, my victory won. May I reach heaven's joys, O bright heaven's sun. Lord of my own heart, whatever be. coming today would you receive this benediction now the lord will go this one who owns us is the one who goes before us to lead us this one who owns us goes behind us to nudge us this one who owns us goes above us to protect us and hey, Renee, this one goes beneath us to carry us when we can't carry ourselves. And to all the other Renees in this place. Amen. Amen.